Well, this morning we're going to talk about the grace we need. I, I was tempted to title this sermon this morning, uh, La Bamba, because, you know, Richie Valens had a song, La Bamba, and, and, and uh, the, Span the Spanish translation is roughly, in order to dance the bamba, you need a little grace. And, and uh, we all have our bamba dance that we have to do in our lives. And so God gives each one of us the grace that we need. And so today we're going to look at scriptures that show how each individual believer fits into the body of Christ as a whole and how God gives each one grace for their particular task or to be the particular part of the body that, that they are. And each person would, would have a unique uh, understanding of that that maybe other people wouldn't know what your particular grace is, but, but God will let you know. So to start with, let's go to Romans chapter 12. Steve actually uh, finished up, I think, Friday night with this particular scripture. In Romans chapter 12, I'm going to read everything this morning out of the Amplified Bible. And... In verse 4, it says, For as one physical body, as in one physical body, we have many parts, and all of these parts do not have the same function or use, so we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ, and individually we are parts one of another. We are mutually dependent upon one another. You know, a lot of the problems that the body of Christ has experienced through the last 2,000 years would be taken care of if, if everybody in the body of Christ realized that right there, that, um, that we are all mutually dependent upon one another. And sometimes that seems a little contrary to reason, uh, you know, Martin Luther probably thought, uh, you know, God has showed me something that, that the, the Catholic Church was not giving me as I was a, a monk, and so I'm separating myself from that, and I'm going to go my separate way. But what if um, the, the, the Catholic Church had, had at that time taken to heart the things that, that God had shown Martin Luther? Think of how different Christian history would have been for the last 500 years, Right? It's, it's because people think that, well, whatever God shows me, uh, you know, I, I'm forging a new path. I'm, I'm, I'm striking out a new direction and to heck with the rest of you. Right? That's happened too much. And uh, verse 6, it says, Having gifts, faculties, talents, and qualities uh, that differ yeah, I mean, everybody can say, well, I'm not like you and you're not like me, you know. My, my abilities or my talents or qualities or whatever you want to call them are not exactly like yours. And yours are not exactly like mine. And that's the way God designed us. That they differ according to the grace given us. In other words... That, that uh, uniqueness that every individual has is an expression of God's grace. Uh, it's, it's because of God's grace that we are not all uh, mashed potatoes, so to speak. That, that each one of us, some people are cauliflower and some people are cayenne pepper. <laughs> okay? Okay, that, that's grace, you know? According to the grace given us, let us use their particular gift. He whose gift is prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion of his faith. See, here's something else about the uniqueness of each individual. Is God's grace in distributing all these different talents and abilities to each person uh, necessitates 
uh, that we operate in faith. You know, if, if, if we were all the same, and, th and by the way, this is something going on in our world right now, and I, and I hope you see it because the world doesn't. All of the things that the media and that the governments of the world are doing right now is try to get everybody in lockstep, to try to get everybody to behave a certain way it's in, so that they will be predictable and controllable. And that is satanic. God does not do that. Now, you know, some, some uh, people in the body of Christ have have recognized that sometimes some people have a different opinion and they're vocal about it and sometimes they, they kind of cop an attitude and they get kind of horsey and so uh, they, they become very dogmatic and authoritative and you, you line up. But see, God is a gentleman. You know, if you're not going to line up, he will let you fall in that hole that's in front of you or, or run across that poison ivy that he warned you about. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. Okay? But anyway, I digress. He who's, uh, verse 7, he whose gift is practical service. You know, if you're not uh, in a pulpit, that doesn't mean you don't have a ministry. Your ministry then is practical service. And if, if you're not, uh, you know, standing on a street corner preaching Jesus and handing out tracts, that doesn't mean you're not a witness for Jesus Christ. You're, you're living your life uh, honorably and, and diligently in front of the world is a witness. In fact, sometimes that's a better witness than, than you preaching to them. I know my father used to have a saying. He said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear it any day. Okay, if your gift is practical service, let him give himself to serving. Like what Steve was talking about Friday night, about give your best to God, and he who teaches to his teaching, and he who exhorts or encourages to his exhortation. There you go, Tom. That, I, I, see, I see Tom Watterson in that one right there. And he who contributes, let him do it in simplicity and liberality. And that's not a political statement there. When it says liberality, that means generosity. Okay, and he who gives aid and superintends, do it with zeal and singleness of mind. And he who does acts of mercy with genuine cheerfulness and joyful eagerness. Now, you know, all of it um, in verse 6 says that all of these things that each person can do have to be done with the grace uh, that is apportioned to them. Well, nobody gets left out of that. Keep the place here in Romans and go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. Of course, this is the, this is the foundation of... of our faith here, it says the Word became flesh, human, incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ, and fixed His tent of flesh and lived a while among us, and we actually saw His glory, such glory as the only begotten receives from His Father, full of grace. See, that's Jesus' love, His power, His His. Uh, might, his wisdom, all of that is an expression of God's grace. <clears throat> and then in verse 16 it says, For out of his fullness we have all received. Every one of us has received something from the Lord. All of us have had a share in and were all supplied with one grace after another and spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. Like you said, Tom, if you hadn't seen the blessings of the Lord, you hadn't been looking. Okay? Uh, and one favor upon favor and gift upon gift. <clears throat> For while the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Okay, go to... Um, 
Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> We've made the point that God gives every person uh, a, a, an enabling, a, a grace, a, 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 a supernatural uh, help to, to, to do what he wants them to do, to be what he wants them to be. But there are some things about this that, that we in the body of Christ need to understand about how that works uh, for the whole of the body of Christ. And uh, the, the, the way God worked in Israel is, is a type and shadow of that. It's not, well, we have to carry on with the, the way they did it. That was the law. And we just read in there, well, the law, that was, that was what God told Moses and that went for... 1400 years and then God sent his son and then what Jesus uh, exemplified is is now our pattern but the process of of God imparting grace to his people there's still a, a pattern to it okay in Hebrews chapter 5 we'll read this here verse 1 it says for every high priest <coughs> chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. <clears throat> and he is able to exercise gentleness and forbearance toward the ignorant and the erring since he himself is also liable to moral weakness and physical infirmities. This is, there's a good little lesson right there in verse 2. It's that if sometimes, and I know we all go through this, if sometimes we're having trouble uh, putting up with somebody else's misbehavior, shall we say, uh, we need to remember that we misbehave sometimes too, don't we? Anybody perfect in here? Okay. And it says, and because of this, verse 3, he, the priest, is obliged to offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as those of the people. Besides, one does not appropriate for himself the honor of being high priest, for he is called by God and receives it of him just as Aaron did. Now that calling thing, that, that's, that's, um, that would be a whole other sermon in itself. But let me just, just kind of tell you what that looks like from my perspective. When I was growing up, I, I, I used to just uh, bemoan the fact that, that I grew up in a family that was so strict and religious. That they read the Bible all the time and that they prayed over every meal and that nobody ever used a curse word. And then I'd get out on the playground and they're cussing like sailors. <clears throat> and, 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 you know, and I thought it was, I thought I was being abused that, that, that I wasn't allowed to go out and, and, and party in corrals like a lot of my classmates were. And, and then even when it came to the time that I was out from under my parents' control and I went out and started partying and carousing and, and I'm out smoking pot with people and I'm singing all four verses of Amazing Grace in the car to them. Well, what I didn't realize was that was, that was an indication that God had called me to be doing what I'm doing right now. And that in those times, and there were actually several, it wasn't just a one-time event. At those times when, when I've finally gave in and responded to God. Um, it's like right away somebody would come along. I remember uh, the first time that I came back to God after, you know, having made a commitment to Him uh, when I was 17 and then I went away to college and you know how that can sometimes go. But then when I came back and, and repented of a lot of the sins that I had done, uh, and started going to the Baptist Student Union, the director of it came to me one day and he said, have you ever thought that God might have called you to the ministry? And, and I knew that. I, I'll t and I'll tell you why I knew that. Because when I did, when I first know that I consciously cried out to, 
to Jesus to save me. Because that, that whole summer that I was 17 and I was out playing piano for teenage beauty pageants. Uh, and, and that God would, that I walked into that church and I opened the, the Bible. I just wanted to walk in there and see what this church looked like. And there was a Bible open and I opened it and said, God's holy wrath is revealed against all ungodliness of men. And I got scared and I ran out the door. Well, when I finally got, got scared enough to really cry out to God, it's like this is the closest thing I think I've had to an open vision where, where it's like I saw the, the brightness of the glory of God and, and Jesus at his right hand and said, Lord, if you'll save me, I'll serve you. And that's what I said. So it's like I answered the call then. But that, that didn't settle it right then. I mean, I didn't immediately go out and start preaching on the street. I mean, I went on about my merry way several times. <clears throat> and, and then, you know, finally come to 1978, and I came back from France because <clears throat> I realized that God had something else for me besides becoming a, a classical concert musician. Um, and, and I met Owen Kane and came to the, to the Romans 8 Ministries meeting at uh, on Wednesday morning, and I, I, I said, I, I want to I come talk to you. I want you to counsel me. So, so I, we made an appointment, and I went down to Joshua, and this was the time that Irene said, well, you're not going to let that guy into our house, are you? <laughs> so he met me down at the pool, and I thought I was getting the royal treatment, getting, getting to talk to Owen down by the pool. I, I gave him my testimony, and he said, well, you know, I think, I think God has a calling on your life. This, and then this was the same conversation where he said, well, I'll tell you this, though. Whatever you know about God, there's more. And, you know, that is just as true for me today as it was in 1978. What I know about God is not all there is. And, and it's the same for all of us. But anyway, I didn't call myself to this. I didn't even call myself to stand in this pulpit. When Owen realized he had run about as far as he could run, he said, Ray, I'm turning it over to you. And I went, <laughs> <coughs> I really did. I mean, I didn't, I didn't want to do this, really. I mean, I did. I wanted to be obedient to God, but I was not uh, coveting this uh, office. But, but you know, there, there's some, some grace that it takes. Um, you know, those of you who, who weren't around Owen and Irene Kane every day on a day-to-day -day basis might not know how much grace it takes to realize that they're human and they're, they fail and they, they blow it and they lose it. And sometimes when that happened to the congregation, the members of the congregation, uh, they didn't take it very well. Uh, they got up and left. Or if, even if they didn't, sometimes they, uh, they copped an attitude that they have not yet let go of. Uh, it takes grace not to do that. And, and, you know, in myself, I don't know how I didn't do that. But, but what I'm saying is, you know, God gave me the grace to, to uh, work under that man and learn what he had and, and for us to discuss the things of God for 40 years. You know, two years after Irene told Owen, you're not letting that man in our house, uh, I was going in their house every day. <laughs> And they were glad for me to do it. So, anyway, that's my testimony. But see, I didn't call myself to hear. It's what I'm saying. And it wasn't just that I had a zeal to preach, because I really didn't. In fact, I don't yet. I'm not doing this because I'm so on fire for Jesus. I mean, most days I get to say, oh, God, help me. <laughs> but he does. And, you know, okay. Now, I realize here in Hebrews, he's talking about Old Testament high priest. And Jesus, of course, is our high priest. And in Revelations, it says that he's called each one of you to be a priest unto God. In Revelation 1, verse 6, it says that. But that said, what God calls, um, he authorizes. And as I said, we, we can look at Israel and we can see by type and shadow how that is supposed to work or what happens when it doesn't work very well. Go to Numbers chapter 16. Keep that idea, that, that word priest, in your mind. Hmm. 
Okay, Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi. Let me stop you right there. The sons of Levi were the priestly tribe in, in Israel. They were the ones who God called and appointed to priestly service. You know, the ones of Judah and Issachar and the others, God blessed them and gave them special graces, special abilities, talents, and so forth. You know, Steve talked about the sons of Issachar. Uh, they knew the times. So that was a special grace. But the, the tribe of Levi was called to be priests. Uh, and I'm making a correlation here because Revelation 1 says we're all called to be priests. So in a sense, you could identify with the tribe of Levi in that sense of being a priest. And we read over there in Hebrews that priests are called to, to offer gifts and sacrifices, that is to pray for themselves and for others. Okay, so Korah is of that tribe, and with him was Dathan and Abiram, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelath, sons of Reuben. And <clears throat> they took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the Israelites, 250 princes and leaders of the congregation. And they called to the assembly men well known and of distinction. So this was not just a, uh, a rabble rousing, uh, you know, Antifa uh, rebellion here. The, these were well known, well respected people in the congregation of Israel. And they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, seeing that all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you lift yourself up above the assembly of the Lord? Well, first of all, that was not what Moses was doing. He was obeying what God had told him. But that's the way it looked to them. Okay, we'll give them that. But look at verse 4. But when Moses heard it, he rolled his hand up in a fist and said, Well, you guys, I'm going to show you who's boss. No, he didn't do that. It says he fell upon his face. Now, it doesn't really tell you in the on the page here, what that falling on your face before the Lord entails. But I tell you what it is for me. <clears throat> if I'm challenged about something that I do or say in the name of Jesus, I go before the Lord and the first thing I do is, is say, Lord, am I blind in some area? Is there some, is there some truth here? that I'm just not open to, that, I, that I'm resisting and rebelling against you. You know, see if there be any wicked way in me. And, I, and that's falling on your face before the Lord. And I know that's what Moses did before verse 5. You know, it's a search in your own heart first. If you're going to fall on your face before the Lord and you're going to pray for some a bad thing that some has happened to you that somebody else has done to you. I recommend you do that one first about seeing go before the Lord with your own self and say, God, help me here. If, if there's something I'm not seeing, you know, clarify this for me. I believe Moses did that, and then in verse five it says, So he then said to Korah and all the company, In the morning, you know, the day of the Lord, in the morning. The Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and he will cause him to come near to him um, who he has chosen. He will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all your uh, company, and put fire in them. See, this is the type and shadow of prayer. <clears throat> and put incense upon them. It says in Revelation that, <clears throat> the incense that goes before God is the prayers of the saints. <clears throat> before the Lord tomorrow, and the man whom the Lord chooses shall be holy. And then he says, you take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. That illustrates a point that any time uh, 
someone criticizes someone else, it's the splinter in the beam thing. You know, if they got one finger pointed somebody else, they got three pointed back at themselves. And Moses is just pointing, okay, you want, you want to bring up this thing about, well, you're, you're on your high horse and you think you're better than everybody else. You're saying that about me? Well, look at yourself. Don't you see you're doing the same thing? Verse 8, and Moses said to Korah, hear, I pray you, you sons of Levi. And then in verse 12, and Moses sent to Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, no, we will not come up. They left. You know, just like, like I said, when some people, if they got crossways with Owen and Irene Cain, and uh, it happened. You know, there, there's a lot of things Owen and Irene Cain did I didn't agree with. And I thought, you know what, they really shouldn't have done it that way. But they did, just like there's some things probably I shouldn't have done and I did it the way that I did. But, you know, I, I stuck with them but some people say, oh, no, 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 you're wrong. I'm out of here. Well, that's what these guys did, apparently. Well, look, there's New Testament examples of this, too. Let's, let's leave the Old Testament because, you know, we need, we're under a better covenant. Go to Ephesians chapter uh, 3. There, there's callings to service, there's callings to offices in the body of Christ, just as there was uh, the priestly tribe under the Old Testament. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 2, and Paul writing to Ephesus says, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was entrusted to me to dispense for you for your benefit. Now this is something every minister needs to, to keep firmly in their thinking, is that what, gives us, what God gives us is not for ours to, to cling to ourselves. I remember Owen used to talk about all the time about, he asked God, well, what is my ministry? And God said, well, you're my delivery boy. And, and it's like that, that metaphor made real good sense to him because when he was young, he used to deliver newspapers on a bicycle. And, and uh, he said that the delivery boy, like if he was bringing flowers to someone that, that was sent from, uh, to a woman from her husband, uh, and he would bring her the flower, you know, special delivery, she, she wouldn't turn around and hug the little boy and say, oh, you're so wonderful. She would realize that she was receiving a gift from somebody else, and he was just bringing it to them. Well... Hopefully what anybody stands in one of these does is to realize that they're just bringing something that God has for the people and it's not something that's theirs to dispense or to keep to themselves. That's what being a stewardship uh, is. <clears throat> and it's for the benefit of the body. He says, and that the mystery which was made known to me, I was allowed to comprehend it in direct revelation, as I have briefly wrote you. You know, for example, like what Steve teaches on Friday night, and has been doing for years, as I was cleaning out the, uh, the crow's nest, as Steve calls it, I, I ran across an uh, end time timeline teaching that went back to 2009. By the way, I still have that stack in there for you, Steve, if you're interested in it. And it's like, God gave him that for us a long time ago. And you're just not going to hear that stuff if, from every TV preacher and every church building in the country. You know, it's a mystery. It's almost a secret, really. It almost seems as if God is not interested in, in shouting that from the housetop and, and telling every, everybody in the body of God. Why, why wouldn't he? Well... We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 4. It says, Yet God's grace was given to each of us individually, not indiscriminately, but in different ways, in proportion to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Then skip to verse 11, um, because this verse 7 connects with verse 11. And his gifts are varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, some prophets, which uh, are inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, some missionaries, some pastors, and some teachers. See, each one of those uh, is like one little aspect of what Jesus would be the full expression of. And it says, and his intention is the perfecting and full equipping of the saints, that they should do the work of ministering. In other words, so that you can fulfill your calling, God puts somebody up here in one of these to share with you what God has given them. Not that you're going to copy them. or I mean, I know Paul at one place says imitate them, but what he's talking about is imitate their faith. Okay, Not imitate their behavior or imitate their lifestyle or, well, they drive a certain car, so you drive that car too. Um, he's saying, you know, conduct yourself... in. In, the, in a manner of, of uh, commitment and faith toward God that, that those who are truly called of God should be living. And in fact, that might be one way you can tell whether somebody is really uh, who they claim to be is are they living it or not. You know, if they're preaching it one way and living it another way, that gives you cause to wonder. Anyway, his intention is uh, the equipping of the saints that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the knowledge of the Son of God. Well, right there tells you one of the reasons why the, the, the revelation of the end times like that which God has shown Steve Jordan is not widely known is because uh, the, the body of Christ is not uh, coming to that place where they are being built up uh, and, and given the, the knowledge and the understanding to utilize that information. That they might arrive at really mature manhood. In fact, most of the church doesn't even uh, preach that. You know, they preach, well, getting saved is what it's all about. And once you're saved, you're in like Flint. Or, you know, if you're full gospel, then, uh, you know, you, you, then you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you're really full, full gospel, then okay, but, you know, you still have those demons and you've got to cast those out. Okay, all of that is fine, but does that mean once you got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and been through deliverance that you have arrived at spiritual maturity? Oh, that wasn't the way it worked for me. Right? No. Okay. That we might arrive, what cause? Here we, here's why we know that's not the case. Because spiritual maturity is the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and the completeness found in Him. No, I hadn't seen anybody there yet. <clears throat> but um, verse 14 goes right along with that. It says, so then that we may no longer be children. Well, what's wrong with being children? Didn't Jesus say that, well, unless you come as a little child, you'll not enter the kingdom? So being childlike is, is necessary for kingdom living, isn't it? Well, this is one of those straights, okay? You know, if, if you're all self-righteous self, uh, and arrogant and, and prideful, then no, you're not going to receive the things of God and you need to humble yourself, which is what being childlike is what the point that Jesus was trying to make. Because he was, he was contrasting that with the way the Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders were. You know, they were, they were the big cheese. And so he's saying, no, that's not it. Being like a child is it. But here he's saying that if you're, if you're naive, if you're immature, uh, then you are uniquely vulnerable to shysters. If you are spiritually immature, you are red meat to religious deception. That's what he says here. So then we may no longer be children tossed to and fro between chance gusts of teaching. Hmm. I thought, it, I thought you're supposed to, supposed to be uh, eager to be 
taught. You're supposed to be teachable. <clears throat> well, you know, teachability with, without striving towards spiritual maturity is a recipe for religious deception. Um, chance gust of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men. Well, wait a minute, they're teaching? They're teaching doctrine? Well, how could they be unscrupulous? Well, <coughs> it's like my dad used to say, the devil works his hardest on Sunday morning. And like, like Owen Cain used to say, religious demons are the worst kind of demons they are. And it's like C.S. Lewis in his book, Screw Tape Letters, had the older demon saying to the younger demon, he said, our master, speaking of Satan, our master's best work is to convince people he doesn't exist. So the, 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 the most powerful and effective demons are the ones that people think are God. Right? If you think some, if some voice in your head and you think that's God and it's not, that is the worst kind of demon. That's worse than the one saying, oh, let's, oh there's some beer out there. Go drink some of it. Or, or wouldn't you like to go to bed with that woman over there? I mean, you know those demons are from the pit of hell. But that one that tells you, oh, well, God wants you to whatever it is. That, that, that is the worst kind of, dis, of religious deception. <clears throat> Okay, there's personal applications for this. Go to Romans chapter 5. This, this business of, of applying God's grace, it's not just so we can fulfill whatever purpose and plan He has for us individually, but so that we can live free, free from deception, Free from the, the heartache and the confusion that the world is just uh, wallowing in. It's terrible. And God wants us free from that. You know, this is the, the weekend that we, we have observed uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. You know, there's, there's something unique about the Declaration of Independence. And I'm not singing the praises of Thomas Jefferson and the, the men who drafted in and signed it. It's the, I'm talking about the idea that they um, tapped into that this, that this that they established when they set up the, the new government here on this continent that all men were uh, equal in the sight of God and, and that they were endowed with inalienable rights. It, it, that... Uh, declarations of independence usually is there some little little minority group within some greater thing. Kind of, we're seeing this happen all over the place now, where they say, "Hey, we demand our rights." Okay, and so they they want to pull themselves out from the the greater uh, body and, and establish their own thing over here. But see, that's not what the Declaration of Independence was, because basically all of those men. Uh, were, were English. So they weren't saying, hey, we're, we're really, you know, we're Irish, we're not really English, and we don't want anything more to do with London and the Queen and all of that. We, we want to set up... That wasn't what that was about. They were recognizing that there was a, a, a way that human government was supposed to work that they were not seeing anywhere on the planet. And so they thought that they could set it up here on this continent. Now... Once again, the devil got right in there and he, he directed things uh, the way he wanted them to go. But the idea w w was a special and unique idea that, that, that we're still grappling with now. Anyway, God wants us free from Babylon. Okay, verse 15. <clears throat> God's free grace is not at all to be compared with the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse or his offense, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow 
to the benefit of many. For if the free gift is not at all to be compared to the effect of that one man's sin, for the sentence of the trespass of that one man brought condemnation, whereas the free gift uh, following the transgressions brings justification, brings righteousness. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's grace reign as kings. You stop right there. His grace didn't just uh, deliver us from having to go to hell. It says His grace um, puts us in right standing with God so that we can reign as kings in life through this one man, Jesus Christ. That, that's heady stuff. So there is more grace for us to lay hold of. This was God's plan for creating Adam and Eve in the first place. The, the angelic realm uh, didn't cut the mustard as far as God having someone he could turn over his creation to to manage it for him. And they're still doing it, by the way. I'm, I'm not saying that, well, that's no longer the case. He turned it over to Adam and Eve, and they failed too, so the, the angelic realm came back and said, okay, no, we're, you know, he, he, he blew it, so we're, we're, go, we're taking our job back. So what God has been doing for these thousands of years is, is to prepare us humans so we are actually fit for the job. Just like God has been preparing me for the last 42 years, so I'm fit for this job. And he's still working on me. You know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm better than anybody. But th this is the process. And hey, with God, a day's a thousand years. So, so he's extraordinarily patient. Anyway, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. You don't let the place in Romans go now. Verse 1, laboring together as God's fellow workers with him then, we beg you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That is a sad thing. When, when people get born again, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. They receive deliverance. They... they they get involved in doing what God wants them to do, and then something comes along and they throw it away. Hey, I did that a couple of times. And the last time I did that in 1978, I told God, I said, hey, I'm not doing this again. But Lord, you're, you're going to have to help me because I know me. I know how, how liable I am to, to just chuck it all and run off and do my thing. And he said, you're not going to do it again. And he's kept me here for 42 years, so I guess... I guess, uh, you know, God keeps his word, doesn't he? Amen. Okay, anyway. Don't, but don't receive the grace of God in vain. The things he's done for you are for his purposes. That merciful kindness by which God exerts his holy influence on your soul, keeping and strengthening you, do not receive that for no purpose. For he says, in the time of favor... I have listened to and heeded your call, and I have helped you on the day of deliverance. Behold, now, July the 5th, 2020, now is truly the time of gracious welcome and acceptance from God. Behold, now is the day of deliverance. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 <clears throat> you know, I, I alluded to the fact that Adam and Eve blew it and that the angelic realm, uh, they had a hand in that. 
obviously, you know, the third chapter of Genesis tells us how that all came about through deception. Okay, and, and how the, the dark side of the angelic realm works, this is the whole business of spiritual warfare. And just because we have learned uh, whatsoever you bind on earth, whatsoever you loose on earth. We haven't learned everything there is about spiritual warfare because how else, how else does all of this stuff happen here if, if God is, is almighty and God is in control like so many Christians say? Well, then God, is, is, God killed George Floyd. And God is burning and looting all of these places. And, and God is, is uh, you know, putting the Antichrist in power in the governments of this world. No, God is not doing that. Well, then how come it's happening? Well, well let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Here's, here's, how, it, here's how Paul came to realize it was happening to him. His particular uh, trial, his particular distress, he was crying out to God about. And he says, and to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to rack, buffet, and harass me and to keep me from becoming excessively exalted. Well, it tells you several things there. It tells you, first of all, his trial came from Satan, not from God. And number two, the, the, the reason why Satan saw fit or felt it necessary to do that was because Paul had received great revelation. And the devil is an opponent of God's revelation. Have you noticed? And thirdly, that there is a human tendency when you have great revelation or when there is a great outpouring of God's gifts and grace in your life, there is a human tendency to become proud. And you, you reading the life of Paul, you can see how he constantly battled that. He talks about himself a lot. Now, I'm glad he does because using himself as an example, we can see a lot of things that would apply to each one of us. But point being, he came to recognize right here as he was crying out to God that this pride in him was a handle that Satan uh, gave Satan some, some uh, entry into his life. And he said, three times I called upon the Lord and besought this, him about this and begged that he might depart, that it might depart from me. God, get this thing off of me. Well, I'm not saying God can't do that or that he never does that. Sometimes he does. But there is also often a, a more uh, ongoing deliverance, a more ongoing purpose which God intends for us to lay hold of. And it's here in verse 9. He says, God said to me, well, my grace is enough for you. It's sufficient against any danger and it enables you to bear any danger manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed and show themselves most effective in your weakness. See, we, we think that God's grace is like Popeye opening a can of spinach and eating it and all of a sudden he becomes Superman. And that's not what God is saying here. He, he said, hey, Popeye, you're still going to be Popeye, but I'm going to deliver you and, and I'm going to transform you from the inside out, not from the outside in. That's God's grace. Therefore, he says, I will most gladly glory in my weakness and infirmities. It's like, hey, okay, I'm Paul. I am who I am. But as Susan Song says, but I will be what I will be because of his great love for me. That the strength and power of Christ the Messiah may rest upon me. James chapter 4. I need to hasten to the end here. 
James 4, verse 5. It says, or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking to no purpose? Now, this is, this is funny. <clears throat> and, and look, I do this too. So, you know, maybe this is one of those things when I point my finger at all of those Christians out there who seem to not be interested at all in anything the Bible says about end time prophecy. Okay, there's, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, there was something the other day that I, I've been over hundreds of times and I just glossed right over. It's like, oh yeah, that's a bunch of words so I can get to really the good part here. And it's like, no, it's every word is for our doctrine and our encouragement and our instruction in righteousness. Every word in here. But he says, do you suppose that the scripture is speaking for no purpose when it says that the spirit whom God has caused to dwell in us yearns over us? that he yearns to be welcome with a jealous love. But he gives us more and more grace, more power of the Spirit to resist this evil tendency and all others fully. That's why God says that he sets himself against the proud and haughty, but he gives grace continually to the lowly, to those who are humble enough to receive it. Okay, let's recap what we've been talking about here today. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 7. It says, The end and culmination of all things has now come near. Indeed it has. Keep sound-minded and self-restrained and alert, therefore, for the practice of prayer. And above all things, have intense and unfailing love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Love forgives and disregards the offenses of others. Practice hospitality to one another, to those of the household of faith. Be a lover of strangers with brotherly affection for unknown guests and foreigners, the poor, and all others who come your way who are in Christ's body. And in each instant, do it ungrudgingly, cordially, graciously, and without complaining, but representing Jesus. And as each of you, you notice this applies to everybody. As each of you has received a gift, a particular spiritual talent, a gracious divine endowment, employ it for one another as benefits good trustees of God's many-sided grace. See, just being a preacher or, or being a, a pastor or apostle or whatever, that's not the only way God's grace is is imparted to the body of Christ. Everyone has an opportunity to impart grace. And a lot of how you do that is found in verse 8 and 9. As you have received a gift, employ it for one another as good trustees of God's many-sided grace. Whoever speaks, let him do it as one who utters oracles of God. Whoever renders service, let him do it as with the strength which God furnishes, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever through endless ages. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word that transforms us. And thank you, Father, for your grace that enables us to be all the things and anything that you have called us to be.